season. I remember those days. That was fun. Oh, I'm. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning at Glade Church. I um, have a few announcements. Um, on October 1st, we are feeding the flock, which means we are feeding the student ministry at Ukirk Cooper House. Uh, again, that's on October 1st. Uh, just this morning, Ashley Strand sent out an email to everyone uh, with a sign-up sheet to uh, bring different things for a taco bar. So uh, the plan is, is that uh, you sign up for whatever you want to bring, and then if you can have it here in the Red Room by 4.30 on the 1st. That is on a Tuesday. It's not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday. And if you get something that can be kept in the fridge, you can bring it the Sunday before, sticking in the fridge or, you know, what have you. But if it's something that you prepare that day, just have it here by 4.30, and then we've got a smaller group of people that'll take it over there because they have four parking spots in the back of the house. And one of those is for the um, Emily, the minister, and, well... And then we'll take one, and then the other, I don't know, somebody takes them up. But um, that's on October 1st. Uh, don't hesitate to sign up. We have a church cleaning day on October 5th to get ready for somebody's wedding. Congratulations, Denise. So um, October 5th, we're going to be having, it's kind of an open house thing. If you can come in the morning, come in the morning. If you can come in the afternoon, come in the afternoon. The big places we're going to hit are the basement fellowship hall, the sanctuary, and the bathrooms, right? Okay. Um, October 20th is our congregational meeting, right after service. Um, a few other things. Uh, volunteers for Sunday morning service. If there is anything that you want to volunteer for, whether it be reading, whether it be singing a special song, whether it be uh, reciting a poem, whether it's giving testimony, uh, we can even go old school, and, and you can give your testimony for the church. Uh, if you want to help out with communion, if you want to help out with the music in any way for the congregational songs, anything you want to do, let me know. I am not going to put anyone on the spot. The only time I do that is when it's time to take up the offering, and I hate doing that. So please come see me if there's anything that you would like to volunteer for. My office hours were going to be on Tuesday. Now they're going to be tomorrow on Monday if you need me. And uh, one last thing, y'all, the other day I got a flu shot. And I'm one of those people that feel like they got the flu after they get the flu shot. So if I seem a little hazy or fuzzy today, that's why. Just bear with me today. That's all I'm saying. Any other announcements? Oh, and don't forget about the mini marshmallows. We're starting a collection. And I haven't touched one. I'm very proud of myself. Thank you, Trips. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay. Let's just take a few moments to prepare our hearts for worship.
can join me for our call to worship. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Happy are those who find delight in God's law. Knowledge of God is a delight to the righteous. They seek to grow in wisdom and understanding. Put your trust in God as you prepare to serve. Learn to be peaceable, gentle, and merciful. Amen. If you will rise as you will are able, we will sing hymn number 743, Step by Step. seated. Please join me in my reading of the psalm. The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water, which bears fruit at just the right time, and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. And that's why the wicked will have no standing in the court of justice. Neither will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Amen. Ashley will read from the book of Mark. This is Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know it. This was because he was teaching his disciples, the human one will be delivered into human hands. They will kill him. Three days after he is killed, he will rise up. But they didn't understand this kind of talk, and they were afraid to ask him. They entered Capernaum. When they had come into a house, he asked them, What were you arguing about during the journey? 
They didn't respond since on the way they had been debating with each other about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be least of all and the servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child, placed him among the twelve, and embraced him. Then he said, Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. Thank you, Ashley. Amanda will read from the book of James. James chapter 3, verses 13 through chapter 4, verse 3. Are any of you wise and understanding? Show that your actions are good with a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom. However, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, then stop bragging and living in ways that deny the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Instead, it is from the earth, natural and demonic. Wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and everything that is evil. What of the wisdom from above? First, it is pure and then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. What is the source of conflict among you? What is the source of your disputes? Don't they come from your cravings that are at war in your own lives? You long for something that you don't have, so you commit murder. You are jealous for something you can't get, so you struggle and fight. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and don't have because you ask with evil intentions to waste it on your own cravings. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will run away from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Thank you, Amanda. And if you will rise again as you are able, we will sing hymn number 192, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Oh. 
please join me in our affirmations? We live trusting God and one another. We live each day seeking to be trustworthy. The rhythms of prayer and service enrich our lives. A gentle spirit and good fruits are the result. God is watching over us and caring for us. In God's hands, our hearts are purified. Amen. I would tell y'all that this is going to be a short sermon because of the way I feel. But I never know what the Spirit's going to do, so I don't want to give y'all false hope. <clears throat> we'll see what happens. In the book of Mark, Jesus had been teaching his disciples about what was going to happen to him. That he would be taken and he would be crucified, and then that he would rise again. But the guys didn't understand this. They didn't understand this, and they were afraid to ask. So in a form of avoidance that most of us probably remember from our school days, they focused on something that they did understand. Gossip. And fighting with each other. And when they came into Capernaum, they stopped to stay in a house for a while, and Jesus asked them what else they had been talking about instead of paying attention to his lesson. Teachers always know when you're not paying attention. The disciples didn't respond since on the way they had been debating about who was the greatest. And that tells me why they were afraid to ask. If you're toting yourself to be the greatest then you're not going to want to be asking questions because you're supposed to already know. It's that facade of self-grandizing that people will sometimes hide behind. They'll say that they're the greatest, but do not ask them any questions with any substance because they'll just change the subject. So then Jesus tells them, you know, don't be arguing about which one of you is the greatest because whoever wants to be first must be least of all and the servant of all. They didn't understand that either. How are you supposed to be great if you're the least? That, that, that was an oxymoron to them. They, it didn't make sense. So they were in this house with children, and I can imagine them running around and playing, and Jesus snatches one of them up and gives them a hug and sets them down in the middle of the disciples, and he says, whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me is actually welcoming the one who sent me. And to understand this statement in the scene that we see this in, you have to understand how children were viewed and treated in Jesus' time and culture. Children, like women, were considered to be property, okay? People were not very nice to each other during this time. Have you picked up on that? People were not nice. Well, they're not very nice today, but... Eh. Now, women, you know, they were at least useful. They cooked and cleaned, right? Children didn't even do that. I mean, they had to be shown everything. And Sandra, she, you know, she mentioned, well, you know, they had a very high death rate, especially with babies, and then even as children grew older, you know, it was dangerous. It was a dangerous time to live in. And, and you know, to, to some extent, that does make sense. And maybe because adults didn't want to... Want to you know, feel too much of an attachment to someone who might likely be gone as soon as you turn around. You know, that led to feelings of, you know, that how children were, were they were seen to be useless, you know, almost inhuman, almost like your, your ox or your donkey. 
Okay, they were not worth your time or your attention. And any time some prominent figure would come to town, the children would all come and gather around. What else were they doing? So when Jesus says to welcome a child in his name, and that would be to welcome himself and God, what he's saying to receive the children as human. Receive the people who are in the margins, who are seen as less than human. The people who use drugs, the people who are homeless and, and who, who have no means or, or no intentions of ever trying to not be homeless because they have such trauma and, and, and such a past that their minds cannot conceive of being able to carry the responsibility of living and paying bills and paying rent. They are in need of, of mental medical care, of, of mental help of, of therapy and of trauma therapy to get them to a place where they can actually see themselves as being human, as being someone who can be responsible for day to day. We have to treat these people with care and respect. We have to treat the needy who can never repay us with care and respect as we do children. We have to minister to the people that a lot of people today and the disciples back then considered to be the least of these. And the reason I don't come right out and say to minister to the least of these is because there is no such thing as the least of these. Amen? But Jesus met these people. When he says the least of these, he is meeting his audience where they are. And his audience, that is how they saw these people. So Jesus is quite literally telling them, go to these people that you see as the least of these and care for them. This means we are here to serve people who, like children, are needy and require a lot of attention. And a lot of times they'll mess up, and children have no filter. They don't care. The way I'm feeling, I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad that there weren't a whole lot more questions and comments because I couldn't have kept up. The kids, they, they don't care about social graces. They don't care about the hierarchy of people. Uh, to them, people are people. And in that respect, children teach us what it means to be a faithful follower of God. Kids are who they are, and that's enough. And to them, you are who you are, no more and no less. Kids are pure. They, they are the way God created us to be until they bow to social pressure and learn to become someone else until they bow to parental pressures and learn to become someone else. Thank God we don't do that. Trips, he's not paying attention. Okay. Jesus attends to the people that society considers to be the least and not the greatest by society standards. And this view is, it was a new order, it was a new way of being, and it was in direct opposition with the self-absorbed nature of his closest followers. In James, we read about two kinds of wisdom, that which comes from the world and that which comes from above. And the wisdom that comes from the world, it's full of bitterness and envy and selfishness and boasting and lies. It's called earthy and unspiritual wisdom. And it's the reason that I've always struggled with Psalm 1. I almost didn't do Psalm 1 for this morning's psalm because in the evangelical churches that I grew up in, it was always pointed to as an excuse for being an exclusive clicky club. It was always the excuse, the justification for we don't hang around with these people because we do not walk in the counsel of the wicked and we do not sit with these people despite the fact that Jesus had dinner with taxpayers and sinners and, and, and sex workers. Okay, we, we don't do that because we are holy and they are not. And this is where wisdom is so important because what the scripture was actually saying if someone were to deign to learn the context and of, of the culture where it came from, what the scripture was saying is that if someone is doing evil, we don't agree with that. If someone is doing evil, we speak out against it. That's what it's saying. It's not saying to shun your neighbor. 
If they don't live up to your standard of living, it's saying to speak out against evil. Do not agree with it. Speak out against it. That's what it's saying. And it is so dangerous when we have teachers who are full of earthly wisdom instead of wisdom from above. It is so dangerous when these people who do not educate themselves in the context of the word, when this word is coming from a culture 2,000 years old, and from a culture that is across the ocean. It is an Eastern culture, and it is something that is foreign to us, and we must educate ourselves. We have to gain the knowledge before we can gain the wisdom. And that knowledge is something that so many people skip over, but it is, oh, spirit. Mm. It's so important to, to gain this knowledge because... Without the knowledge of the word and where it comes from, then we cannot be ready to receive the wisdom that the Spirit will give us. Amen? We've got to build the foundation. So this earthly wisdom, a lot of times it's selfish, and this selfishness leads to disorder and chaos. We're feeling that. And this desire for, for power and status, it was obvious among Jesus' followers and it's obvious still among a lot of the world today. And where Jesus teaches gentleness and kindness, you know, this is wisdom that comes from above. If you have gentleness and kindness, you're going to be great in the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven judges greatness by a whole different set of rules than this world does. So Jesus teaches gentleness and kindness to those who need it the most, even though it's ruthlessness and greed that marks what most leaders strive for both then and today. And we, as followers of God, we are expected to set aside greed and ambition for a different kind of greatness. And this greatness is a virtue that looks like weakness and foolishness by capitalist standards. But it's following the way of Jesus and the prophets. We are to set aside personal ambition. And instead, we are to work for justice and show compassion and serve the people who are needy and could never pay us back. And to do so with humility. Amen. If you will rise as you are able... We will sing hymn number 458, Thy Word. seated as we move on to prayer time I just want to um, say that we need to keep Eva in prayer where she had COVID last weekend and um, just hoping that she is feeling better and getting back on her feet and uh, this past week um, Sandra and I had someone in our lives pass away. Uh, some of you know that uh, there was a time where we attended uh, MCC of the Blue Ridge in Roanoke, and uh, 
a girl named Laura. She was, I think, in her, maybe in her late 30s. She was 30, 36. She was in a fatal car collision uh, earlier in this week. And Laura, she, she was just a light. Um, she was a mental health worker, and she just had this compassion for, for anyone. And she was the first one to reach out. She would take people under her wing. She had a beautiful soprano voice. She was a deacon. She was a board member. She, when she dedicated herself to being a follower of Jesus, she jumped in with both feet, and she never touched bottom. And um, I just ask that we keep her, her family in prayer. She was really close with her family. I think every Saturday just about, she was at their house watching the Alabama football game, Roll Tide. That was the girl's one fault. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but uh, if we can keep her family in prayer, if we can keep MCC in prayer, because she was such an integral part of, of their congregation and their church. Um, she was taken too soon. She was a friend. God in your mercy. Uh, any other concerns or, or joys? I'm having a cardiac catheterization done on Friday. Um, I've needed a stent for a while, and um, I put that off while I was having all my ankle surgeries, but it's time to get that done, so I would ask for prayers that that procedure go well and that the surgeon be skilled. Um, and I'd like to remember my friend Steve, who is living with terminal cancer. God in your mercy. I have a joy that started out as a concern uh, the Afghan family that I volunteer for. Last week, the mom was in a car accident. Um, it was her fault, but she was starting to have some pain. Um, and they took her to the emergency room and tried to get the pain under control, but ultimately had to do a C-section, which she was going to have a C-section anyway. But it was very traumatic for her when she had the accident. She had her other two children with her. And um, fortunately, mom and baby are all okay. The baby was born that night later. And they're home from the hospital and everything's fine. But, it, you know, she wasn't all that prepared yet for the birth. And, and the accident was very traumatic. So keep her in your thoughts and prayer. Her name is Tomina. Tomina? I'm not sure whether to say praise God or God in your mercy. Both. God in your mercy. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, conti continued prayers for Judy Bircher. Yeah. God in your mercy. Anyone else? Anyone on Zoom? Let us pray. God of our understanding, I thank you for your love, and I thank you that you are always, always with us, and that you know our concerns and our joys before they ever leave our lips. God, I lift up Laura's family and MCC of the Blue Ridge. I lift up Thayer with her procedure on Friday. I pray that, that she has peace about it and comfort, that the, process, that the procedure is not only successful, but that it's relatively pain-free. And I, I pray for the surgeon, for his skilled hands, or her skilled hands. And we pray for Steve, who's still, he's still living, 
by your grace. And I pray that what time he has left is joyful and pain-free and comforted. That he knows he is loved and blessed. We pray for Tomina and the newborn baby. We thank you. We thank you for the, the birth of that healthy baby. And we pray for the family as they scramble to get ready for the birth that wasn't going to be here quite so soon. And we pray for Judy. She hasn't been able to be among us for a while. She's struggling. And God, I just pray that as we lift her up to you, that you touch her. You touch her body. You touch her lungs. Let her breathe in deep lungfuls of air. Heal her. Touch her body. Keep her spirits up. Keep her, keep her in good spirits. And never let her forget that she is loved and she is thought about and cared for. Loving God, unspoken prayers, we lift them up to you as well. And I know that you already have them in hand and I thank you for the honor and for the opportunity to give them over to you. All of our cares, all of our concerns. I thank you for your unending, bountiful love. And I pray that your love and that your grace and that your spirit pours out onto all of us right now. Thank you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts and who guides us along our way. And thank you for Jesus who came to teach us how to follow the words of the prophets and who taught us how to pray when he said, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we take up our offering, can I get Ray and uh, Rebecca to come up and take the plates around? As the plate comes to you, I ask that you remember that it is because of you that our church is able to change, our lot, cha to change lives of those in our community, and I, I hope that you give as you're able. Thank you. seated. May God bless you and keep you. May their face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And as their face turns toward you, may it bring you peace. I pray that as you go out into the world this week, that you seek the wisdom that God imparts, that you put your trust in God, and that you are renewed every day in the Holy Spirit. Amen.
You are all invited for coffee and snacks in the fellowship room. Thank you for joining us this morning. Go in peace.